improve on computability, we've got to find some way to get a contradiction. It can be by doing a reduction, or it can be some more direct way of getting a contradiction. And for certain problems, getting a direct contradiction is easier. For other problems, getting a reduction is easier. In theory, you can always use either strategy for any problem. But oftentimes, if you don't have a similar problem to start with, doing the reduction is going to be harder than getting a contradiction. And I'll, I'll mention, for this one, if you try to solve this by doing a reduction, it's really tough. The reason that there's a straightforward way to do that is to show that, well, because we're doing idealist Python, we have plus. So we can always add something to the output of BOA. What should n be there for this to get a contradiction? Yeah, so let's, uh, well, we need to have a, a function. Getting a contradiction by writing Python code is a lot shakier than getting contradiction by writing a Turing machine, because it assumes everything in Python exists. But we're using idealized Python, which does exist. Well, it doesn't exist, but in idealized Python, we can assume everything we expect exists. So we're going to have some contradiction. And it's going to return. What this n should be is the length of what we're defining. Because whatever BOA returns for that length should be the biggest number that any function of that length can return. And that's certainly well defined. There's some value that's the biggest thing you can return by a function of that length, and we're going to add one to it. But that length was the length of the function, including the add one. So it's a contradiction. Right? There's nothing it can return that is actually the correct value. So it must not exist. But what about this one? Now we're going to define, and this, this gets to be a pretty weird thing. So you've seen some busy beaver problems. And maybe it's not that surprising that, well, you can't compute the exact value of busy beaver. Because that sounds like a, it's a complicated function. Maybe that's why we can't compute it. So what this is asking is, can you actually compute an upper bound on it? And in this case, because it's an upper bound, it's not just one function. right? It's a whole set of possible functions. Any function that always returns a number bigger than the actual in this case, we're talking about the furthest tape cell, but it could be the number of steps. Any function that returns a number bigger than that is OK. To me, it's much weirder result in some sense that you can't compute it exactly, that you can't even compute an upper bound. But let's prove that you can't. Part A, is this well defined? Is there some natural number that is the correct value, that would be a correct value, right? There could be more than one for this beyond b function that I've defined for any input. If you knew a particular machine, so for any given machine that halts, you could run that machine, and you could look at the furthest tape square that it writes into. There's some natural number that is the number of that tape square. So that must exist. Why can't we compute it? So how will we prove that this is uncomputable? So let's assume that we can compute it. So this is the way all of our getting a contradiction to something being computable proofs are going to start. We're always going to have to assume that we can compute it, and there's some machine that can compute it. And now we want to use that machine to produce something else. And usually, halts is a good thing to try to produce. It doesn't have to be halts, right? It can be anything that you already know is uncomputable. But let's see if we can make halts. So suppose you know the furthest tape cell. Do you know how many different configurations of the Turing machine there are? If it never writes beyond cell Z, right? So we've got Z as the, if it computes it, we can get that number. Do we know how many different configurations there are of the Turing machine if we know z is the beyond number for the number of states? Well, now we don't have an infinite tape, or we don't need an infinite tape. If we know that we never write past cells z, our tape is from 0 to z. So 
we know that the number of configurations is finite. So there are something like the size of the tape alphabet to the Z. Time as well, it's also times the number of finite states. So it's big, right? It's some big number, but it's finite. So in order for a Turing machine to not halt, if we know these are all the possible configurations, what would happen for it to not halt? Yeah, it would have to repeat. If it repeats a configuration, it's going to not halt. If it doesn't repeat a configuration, in order to halt, it has to eventually get to a configuration where it stops. That means, at most, it can be in this number of different configurations. If it goes past that, it has to have repeated one. If it repeats a configuration, it's going to repeat forever. So that means that we can simulate a machine up to about that number of steps. We'd have to attempt it, but there's some finite number of steps that we can compute based on z that if we simulate the machine for that number of steps, it must, or we could even keep track of the configurations, right? it must have repeated a configuration if it hasn't halted. So we can implement halts by running for that number of steps. If it hasn't halted by that number, it's never going to halt because we have a bound on the number of configurations. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what's a configuration? Turing machine has the state that it's in and the tape. So the configuration is the current state and everything on the tape. So that means it's, it's everything about the execution state of the Turing machine is captured in that configuration. The finite state that you're in and everything that's on the tape. So if the number of configurations is finite, then your execution either repeats configurations or it eventually stops within that number of possible configurations. Without knowing Z, the number of configurations you don't have a bound on. Because the tape is infinite, you can always generate a configuration you've never seen before if you go off the edge of the tape and write a new symbol. But if you know that you never go past slot Z, then you've got a bound on the number of configurations. That gives you a bound on the number of steps you could possibly go without repeating, which allows you to, to know either the machine will halt before then or it will never halt. So this is the configuration. So we're in a Turing machine, we've got our states, and we've got our tape. If we're in the same configuration, right? Same configuration means we are in the same state, and this tape matches exactly. We're always going to do the same thing. The rules are deterministic. Each rule here is based on what's on the tape, where you're reading. If everything's the same, it's always going to do the same thing. So it must be an infinite loop if you ever get to exactly the same configuration, which means you're in the same state and everything on the tape is the same. Once, once you repeat a configuration, whatever you did after that, so from that point, you could do a whole bunch of stuff, go through a whole bunch of states, write a bunch of stuff on the tape, but if you ever get back there, you're going to do exactly the same thing. If what's on the tape is the same as what was on the tape, the last time, and that means the whole tape, not just the square you're looking at. To be the same configuration, the whole tape's the same, the same state, you're going to do the same thing. So the only thing you can do is run forever if you've got back to the same exact configuration you were in before.